Yeah. Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 62 of the Protection Dog Podcast, where we offer an alternative to conventional training methods and philosophy. I'm your host, Joel Riles, and today we are going to talk about a question that I got from one of our listeners about what to do with a dog if you are having family disputes. Uh, neighborly disputes, that sort of thing, and uh, we're going to get into uh, some of the do's and don'ts of that particular topic. So hopefully this will be uh, really helpful for you guys today, but before we get into that, let's talk about today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Fortress Canine. Fortress Canine is bringing you peace of mind through protection dogs. So if you want a protection dog that you can also be confident that it's not going to bite when it's not supposed to, it's not going to bite anybody out in public, it's not going to do anything aggressive with your children or when you have guests over at your house, then we are the company you wanna talk to. So we offer personal protection, family protection, and executive protection dogs. Our dogs start at $20,000. So I like to get that price point out there so that you don't call expecting a $2,000 dog. That's what we sell our puppies for. Um, but we do try to make sure that we have options available for anyone who wants to get a dog uh, to protect their family. And uh, our protection dogs are sold through Fortress Canine. You can find out more information about our dogs by visiting our website, FortressCanine.com. You can email me at Joel at Fortress Canine. Uh, you can also text me at 813-836-9244. If you call and leave a voicemail, um, I promise to get to it in the next six months, but if you want a timely response, please text me. You can also find us on Facebook by uh, searching for at Fortress Canine Dogs. On Instagram, we are at Fortress Canine, and you can find us on YouTube by just searching uh, Fortress Canine. That's also, by the way, where the video version of all of these podcasts is posted at. Uh, but the podcast is the most up-to-date. It's about four to six episodes behind on the YouTube channel because it's a much longer, slower upload process uh, than it is for the audios for the podcast. Uh, don't forget also, we uh, are currently only have, as of the recording of this video, we currently only have uh, two of our puppies left that are on ground and we are not going to have another litter until later this year but we are already receiving deposits on those. So we're gonna have a Malinois and a Dutch Shepherd breeding later this year. So if you are interested in getting one of our Malinois or Dutch Shepherds, please make sure you contact me as soon as possible. Uh, I will let you know everything you need to do to get on that reservation list. Like I said, puppies start at $2,000 and uh, they are a $500 deposit to reserve. I'll send you the contract. We'll get everything squared away. So if that's what you're interested in doing, uh, reach out. The best way to do that is to text me or DM me on either Facebook, Instagram, or send me a text directly on my phone and uh, we will get you set up as quickly as possible. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and jump into today's topic. So I just realized as I was typing the notes out for this, I deleted the actual comment, which I was going to read to you. But the crux of the question was, um, you know, hey, sometimes, you know, me and my wife argue, what should we do with our dog during that time? Sometimes uh, extended family members come over like during a Thanksgiving or a family visit or something like that. And, uh, and we get into a disagreement and we're going into various different things. Uh, you know, how should we handle the dog during these situations? Should the dog be left out? Blah, 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 blah. So um, I'm going to expand a little bit on those thoughts and questions just to address uh, dealing with either real confrontation or potential uh, confrontation in terms of how it's viewed by the dog and then give you my recommendations on that. A quick caveat at the beginning, um, 
I know our dogs and I have worked with a lot of other lines of dogs over the years. So the things that we'll talk about are generally what I have found to be true. Uh, but every dog is slightly different and there are some dogs that are very, very serious dogs. And the general best practice for a dog that's a very, very serious dog, uh, kind of like doesn't play games, you know, isn't interested in uh, lots of petting and running around and chasing balls and playing with other dogs and all that sort of thing. It's just a really serious dog. Uh, in those situations, I would put those dogs away before you have any kind of uh, confrontation or anything that could get even verbally heated. Uh, and, and that doesn't always mean that you're mad or angry or upset at each other. Sometimes you're just passionate about a topic. The other person is passionate about the, the opposite perspective on that topic. And because of that, um, voices get raised. Um, you know, we're, we're animated with our arms and our bodies sometimes. And uh, so if you have a dog that is a, one of those really serious types of dogs, um, despite everything else that you'll hear about most dogs, uh, I would put those dogs away, okay? Put them in a crate, ideally a crate in, in another room. And, uh, and just don't, don't worry about having to deal with it during that situation. All right, but for all the other dogs, let's get into this. So the first thing in my mind is, let's answer the question of, is this a concern? Is it a concern that your dog is going to react a certain way um, if voices are raised, if bodies become animated, um, you know, there could even be, you know, confrontational, but there's, a, there's passion, right? Passion in the, in the argument and the debate and all that kind of stuff. And trust me, I've been there. I have strong opinions about things in case you couldn't tell from listening to this podcast. Um, and I've gotten now, as I've gotten older, where I'm happy to have those conversations and I'll still get passionate if we uh, discuss things that I have very strong opinions on, but I could care less about, you know, initiating those conversations. I really uh, don't care anymore about initiating those, but sometimes other people want to talk about them. And so I'm still happy to have those conversations. And sometimes passion just brings out what sounds like to other people, uh, confrontational type tones in our voices, right? So we have the, the simple answer to that. Is this a concern? The answer is yes, it is a concern. It is something you need to be aware of. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's the end of the world. It doesn't mean you can't have a dog. It's just things that you want to make wise decisions um, if you're going to find yourself in these situations or if that's the kind of person you are. When I was younger, uh, people would come over and I would initiate conversations um, and then we would get into these you know, passionate debates and all this other kind of stuff. Now, my friends were similar personalities and things of that nature. Um, and, and if you're passionate about a topic, you tend to get passionate about very even niche parts of that topic. So you guys could agree on 98% of a topic, but if you're very passionate about it, you'll somehow find that 2% that you disagree on and you'll you'll go right there and that'll be where the, the discussion goes, right? And if you're a debater uh, by nature, I'm kind of naturally a debater. Um, I'm naturally a very logical person, so I think through a lot of the arguments before I ever have them. And therefore, I tend to have more um, uh, more strong opinions, uh, a stronger belief that I'm right because I've thought it out. Um, and when you're younger, when I was younger, you tend to uh, just immediately dismiss anybody who has a counterpoint. Uh, now that I'm older, uh, I will tend to, if somebody brings up a point that I haven't considered before, uh, or an angle on a point that I haven't considered before, I try to kind of go, hmm, hmm, yeah, I've never thought about that. Can't really comment on it. Like, I have to give that some thought. We could try and hash some things out here in the conversation, but I'm willing to just say, don't know. I haven't thought about that yet. When you're young and super passionate about things, you tend to be stupid in that category. I know I was. And uh, if you're offended by that, suck it up, buttercup, snowflake. If you're offended by things, when people uh, disagree with you, then you're weak and get strong. But if this is you, you find yourself in this, and that's fine, everybody's different places, right? Um, then we need to deal with this. So let's get into some of these specific things. Family disputes. When I say family disputes, I'm talking husbands, wives, parents, children. Um, if you live right next to like, you know, your parents, and so it's like grandparents, parents, and children, things like that, I would include that in this. Um, but this is not extended family. By that, I mean people you see infrequently, right? This is people that the dog is very familiar with, the dog lives with, or, or are over at the house almost all the time. 
Uh, you may even include in this like very close friends if you and your very close friends are together um, one or more times a week, right? So they're over very, very frequently. So family disputes. In this particular situation, unless these people turn on you, which is largely unlikely when you have really close relationships, um, then I go, I typically let the dogs get used to the environment, okay? And in the beginning stages of these, uh, and, and, you know, so let's say you have a new dog or uh, you've moved and now you're closer to people who are, you're very close to and they're coming over a lot and you, you tend to be a person who you have these discussions, debates, arguments, right? Um, in the beginning, you need to be very aware of your dog. In fact, anytime you see your dog getting you know, anxious or getting like really hyper-focused on what's happening, um, you look over and go, it's okay, you're good, we're just chatting. Give them a little rub on the head, let them know. I know this seems a little stressful to you right now, but this is normal, nothing's wrong, okay? And there is there is an actual training process to that. It largely consists of doing just that, but it requires you to be observant and aware of the dog in these beginning phases of these types of discussions, okay? It often helps, um, usually in these situations, one person tends to be a little bit more passionate than the other, and so one person is less like hyper focused on the discussion and they can point out, hey, the dog's kind of upset right now. They look like really intense on this topic. Um, you know, we probably need to address this with the dog, right? And then a couple of things, a couple of solutions um, can be had in that situation. One is you can just tone it down. Like if it's just a passionate thing and you're just excited about whatever it is you're discussing, um, just toning it down and telling the dog, it's okay, everything's good, is one solution. Another solution is if you're actually upset, if you're actually having uh, you know, a marital argument, if you're actually having a friend-to-friend -friend argument, or if, you're, if the topic that is being discussed is one that is um, one that you actually get angry about, right? So uh, you know, popular ones are things like politics. If you're a Republican and your friend's a Democrat or vice versa, those discussions, when they're had, will often, people will get really upset about um, people not agreeing with their particular perspective. Um, and so it's often because of a lack of you know, being able to communicate well, um, but nevertheless, that happens frequently. In those situations, you're actually getting upset. It's not just a passionate, um, excited argument. Then I recommend putting the dog away. Okay, uh, and we're gonna get into the, some more details on what each of those things mean. Um, but if you're just excited, my recommendation is, if you don't have one of those super serious dogs we talked about in the beginning, is just communicate with the dog. Don't worry, everything's good, you're fine. And if in a couple of, you know, four to five exposures to this type of situation, the dog is still showing a lot of like, mm, I don't really like this very much, then I go, okay, yeah, in those situations, let's just go ahead and put them away. Right, I will just say this right now, you're, unless the person that you're arguing with actually attacks you and becomes an actual threat to you, you're never gonna go wrong putting the dog away, okay? It, it, you're, that's your easy solution. But a lot of people don't wanna put their dogs away, so they wanna figure out how they can keep their dogs with them, even when these types of situations happen. The best way to do that is to go through this communication process with the dog, be aware of the dog, give the dog some little love, and if they growl, bark, or move out of position when they're not supposed to, especially if these dogs are protection trained, then they might need a correction, right? And you give them their correction, you put them back in their place, you tell them, relax, chill, everything's good, all right? So that is fam you know, family disputes where it's very close, close family, okay? Extended family, now you may feel very close to extended family, but when I'm referring to extended family, I'm talking about people who your dog does not see very often. So maybe every three months to a couple times a year, okay? Um, so they're not over, uh, even every month, you, they, you might fall into the, the family, the close family category, um, depending. But if the person's only over occasionally, then they fall into the extended family rule. Now this is important because you may have grown up with these people, you may be very, very close uh, you know, emotionally and, and you feel very close to these people, but your dog doesn't know these people that well, 
Okay, so that's important to take into consideration. Your dog only sees these people every once in a while, and if every time your dog sees these people, there's some kind of confrontation, your dog is going to develop a strong dislike for these people. In fact, every time they come over, your dog may bark at them or may growl at them, uh, or, or may just like take a blocking position on you between you and them, okay? If your dog is acting that way, then my recommendation is put the dog away. If your dog is a dog that's just a lot more calm in those situations and doesn't seem to be bothered by it, then you know I would still keep an eye on them the first several times things like this happen. Make sure that they don't have a negative reaction sometime in the middle of an argument and follow that process, right? But be aware, these dogs don't, they're, they're not humans, they don't have human thoughts, they don't have human emotions. Now they don't have any thoughts or emotions, but they're not human thoughts or emotions. And so be very, very cautious about leaving your dog out in these situations until they've proven themselves a couple of times, all right? And, and depending on who these people are, sometimes these people are still very trustworthy and sometimes they may not be that trustworthy. And if they're not that trustworthy, then I don't wanna put my dog away, right? I may just wanna limit my, my interactions and contact with this person, all right? So, but make wise decisions in it. You have to make wise decisions from a protection perspective, and you have to make wise decisions from the perspective of uh, the safety of everybody involved, including the dog, because you don't want them to do something that they shouldn't have done, and then end up in a situation where now their life is at risk, right? All right, and then we have the situation that I'm most asked about, which is what about roughhousing in the house, right? So sometimes people have uh, kids that like to roughhouse, teenagers whose friends come over and they like to roughhouse. Um, sometimes parents, you know, do a lot of kind of defensive training with their children. And so to the dog, it may look like, um, you know, there's a fight going on depending on the situation, how far that you're advanced and all that sort of thing, right? So roughhousing is one of those things where, for me personally, I trained all my dogs to be okay with me roughhousing with my children or them roughhousing together, all right? And I did it exactly the same way that I described earlier with, uh, you know, it's okay, leave it alone. But the first several, you know, I'd say 12 times were roughhousing. We're, we're roughhousing, but I'm keeping a, a close eye on the dog the entire time. Right? And they start to get a little uncomfortable. They start to kind of creep forward toward what's going on. I say, no, it's okay, get back to your place. Everything's fine, right? You're vocal in that situation. You do not want your vocal to be really mean unless the dog has, has messed up like four or five, six times in a row, okay? Uh, then you might need to like fooey that, get back to your place. But as a general rule, I want my, my mannerism and communicating with the dog to communicate don't worry, it's fine, right? It's okay, go back to your place, we're just roughhousing, okay? And dogs pick up on aggression, like they actually, somebody who's actually intending to harm someone else has a, like the dogs can detect the difference between that and people who are just making the movements and the motions, okay? And when, when people are just making the movements and the motions, it looks similar, there's similarities to it in the dog's mind, but they can detect the difference and if you communicate with them, this one's okay, and then if you have somebody who's doing your protection training for you that knows what they're doing and is training dogs for aggression, not just for fun as a game, uh, and we've talked about that plenty in the past so I won't go into it here, uh, then the dogs go, oh, when there's aggression, I do something about it. When there's no aggression, they're just kind of going through the motions and, and you know, essentially playing, just playing rough, then that's okay, I can leave that alone. Right, but it is something, like sometimes I would let my kids wrestle or play and then I would watch the dog and have the lead in my hand so I could correct if needed. Um, sometimes I would wrestle with the children and I would just keep an eye on it. Uh, I may ask another child or your spouse or something like that to keep an eye on the dog and let me know if I get distracted, let me know um, that the dog's you know moving out of position or whatever and we need to come and, and deal with that situation. 
So I do that until the dog relaxes into those situations, until the dog no longer reacts when we're roughhousing. Uh, if you don't want to go through that process, then again, you never go wrong by putting the dog away. Okay, so there's a couple of different ways that you can put the dog away. So here's some of your different options that you have in these situations. The one I typically use is the crate. If you get a dog from us, it comes home to you being crate trained. They're very comfortable in their crates. They don't mind going and spending time in their crates. Um, when you do your delivery, you get a lot of information on how and when and why to use the crate for various different situations. And so if one of these situations is going to come up and you're not comfortable dealing with it or doing the things that we're talking about here, then you can just put them in their crate, okay? Um, you may notice that if the crate is in the same room with what's going on, the dog may get upset. If the crate is in the same room with what, it, what is going on, the dog may become even more relaxed and then you don't even need to use the crate after a little while because they're just like, oh yeah, they just do this sometimes. Um, and then if you put the dog in another room, the verbals sometimes will upset the dog, right? But at least they're in their crate, they're, they can't come out and mess with somebody. If you have not crate trained your dog, uh, putting your dog in a plastic or a wire, just the, the metal wire crates, uh, is probably not gonna work really well, depending on how upset your dog gets. Dogs can break out of both of those types of crates pretty easy. Uh, if they really want to, okay? The, those crates contain a dog when a dog is content to stay in them and um, they may push against it a little just to see if the door is open or whatever and if it is, they might wander out. But if they're really intent on getting out of a wire crate or a plastic crate, uh, especially an adult dog, puppies, not so much necessarily, but adult dogs, uh, they will break those things to pieces and get out of them, okay? So if your dog is getting really upset and especially if you use a plastic crate and they break out of a plastic crate, you're gonna need to go with something much more heavy duty and hardcore. Uh, something like a gunner crate or an impact dog crate or one of the crates that are designed uh, to hold dogs that are trying to escape them, okay? Um, but if you do your crate training, if you want to know how to do crate training the way that we do it, you can go on to canineacademyonline.com. We have a, a whole section there on how to do crate training with your dog. Uh, it's very, very helpful, very useful. I highly recommend it if you don't already do it. But crates are a great way to do it. But if you're going to use the weaker crates, and I use plastic crates all the time, um, but I have dogs that are crate trained and are very comfortable in their crates. All right. So the other thing that you can do, the other option you have is use a different room or separate the situation from the house versus outside okay so different room first so if you're gonna use a different room you know some people have a room that they put the dog in right it might be the laundry room might be something like that so instead of using a crate uh, a lot of people just have a room in the house and when they leave the house to go to work or different things like that they use this room as kind of like the dog's room and the dog goes in there and stays in the room and uh, and all that kind of stuff um, that can work if your dog is used to it. Oftentimes what I hear when people have a quote room for the dog is they usually like on an interior door, they're usually just thin sheets of wood with a, a real kind of frail uh, frame that's built. They kind of glue the sheets of wood on the frame. So if you wanted to kick it or, or punch through it, it wouldn't be that difficult to do. Um, and if you have one of those doors there, a lot of times the one, the part of the door on the inside where the dog is and spends a lot of time, uh, there's giant holes in it, right? Because the dogs get anxious and they try and, and break out of it. If that is your dog, then this option may not work great, right? You might wanna put the crate in that room and have a crate and the door closed or something like that. Um, if your dog is very comfortable in the room and does not react that way and does not try to break out of the room even without a situation happening outside, then the room, putting the dog in the room can be a really good option. Uh, another thing, and this applies to um, any kind of like friendly debate slash roughhousing, okay? Uh, so, you know, when you're having actual arguments, um, you know, where people are actually upset and angry uh, with each other, um, it's a lot harder to plan th these kind of things out. But when you have a dog uh, where you're just debating uh, or the kids just want to roughhouse or you want to roughhouse with the kids, um, 
putting either the dog outside, like in a fenced in back area, you know, someplace where you trust that they're gonna you know, be safe and contained, um, that's one option and it's always a good option. Um, and then the other option is, and I did this a lot with my kids when they wanted to rough house, is cause, not because of the dog per se, but just because I didn't want them rough housing in the house all the time, is I'd say, go outside and, and wrestle. Right, go outside and, and do your you know, Nerf gun wars or your sword fighting with your, your plastic training swords or whatever it was that they wanted to do and they wanted to whack at each other or shoot you know, the Nerf guns at each other and all that kind of stuff. I would just say, go outside. I don't want that in the house. Right? You're gonna swing that sword and it's gonna knock something off the counter or whatever and then I'm gonna be upset. So, um, and then the dog stayed inside, kids went and, and played outside and it was never an issue. Right? So separating the dog from the situation um, obviously it removes the concern that the dog would have a negative reaction. Now if you do that a lot and the dog does not see these interactions uh, hardly ever because you're consistent and you just either put the dog out or have the kids or whoever's going to be roughhousing go outside and do it in a separate place. Um, understand that because the dog is not exposed to that, if the dog is exposed to it, you know, accidentally or whatever happens and there's a situation where all of a sudden now the dog's in the house and that starts up, the dog may get upset. The dog may bark, the dog may growl, um, that sort of thing and you need to be aware of that sort of thing, okay? So, you know, having a protection dog can be very, very safe. Just like having a gun in the house that's fully loaded can be very, very safe. But in both situations, you have to make wise decisions and, um, and responsible decisions to make sure that somebody who shouldn't have that gun in their hand doesn't get it and in the same manner make sure that the dog is not exposed to a situation for the first time uh, when they're being set up for failure rather than being set up for success. Okay, so that is another way of separating the dog and quote, putting them away. Then the other thing, and we've mentioned this briefly but I'll just kind of go through the process a little bit here, is training the dog to relax in these situations. Personally, I want my dogs to be trained to only bite in two situations. If I tell them to, that's situation number one. And situation number two is if I'm physically attacked, okay? Now, when we say physically attacked, I'm obviously not going to be physically attacked if we're just having a debate, right? Or we're just having an argument and nobody's throwing things at each other, nobody's hitting each other. It's just a verbal confrontation. In fact, I want my dogs trained to deal with verbal confrontation in a very positive manner. By positive, I mean they just go, eh, sometimes people have verbal confrontations, right? And they just stay relaxed and calm throughout that situation. You may, if you have a protection dog, find yourself in situations and positions where you're in a verbal confrontation where you and the other person have no right to have a physical confrontation the other person has no intent on having a physical confrontation and you don't want a physical confrontation and so therefore there's maybe some kind of verbal um, altercation you know get back stop following me whatever the case may be uh, you're an idiot go away I'm leaving you know and you're yelling at each other but the um, but there's not going to be there's not a true threat and there's not going to be direct confrontation a dog a protection dog especially but any dog should observe that, be aware and alert to it, but should not respond unless there's actual physical contact, unless there's, you're actually attacked, right? So that's my, that's my opinion on how we train dogs and how we want things to happen when we have protection dogs, okay? Then the other thing is when I tell them to. So, so as the human, I may see the person I'm having a altercation, a physical or verbal altercation with, Maybe they draw a gun, or maybe they pull a knife, or something like that, right? Um, and in that situation, I may decide to send the dog to bite, and they go and bite. Other than those two situations, I don't want any of my dogs biting, okay? And that's how we train our dogs, that's how we stabilize our dogs. We run our dogs through lots and lots of situations so that they learn that they only do it when that happens, okay? Then, um, if you do that, then in all these other situations, they should be relaxed, okay? So what we do is initially, I expose the dog to these situations where it's almost like a mock situation and I have control of the dog. So either I'm holding the lead or I have the lead draped over something that I can easily reach and get to and we're just, we're mimicking the situation so that the dog is hearing elevated voices, all of that sort of thing 
but they're they're not allowed to respond. Now, if you have a protection dog, whether it's been trained by us or somebody else, and you've never done this type of thing before, you want whoever the dog may potentially target to probably have some kind of protective equipment on. Now, you can do this by putting a muzzle on the dog. You can do this by having the person have like some kind of bite sleeve or maybe a jacket or something like that. Depending on the training that you've had in the past, that may actually amp the dog up more. Um, but again, I want my dogs to be safe and stable even when they see what looks to them like a bite suit. Uh, often it is an actual bite suit, but if you live in a place where it's cold in the winter, everybody looks like they're wearing a bite suit in the winter time to a dog. So just be aware of that. That's the training process I do. So I go through, I do mock uh, type situations with the dogs. Then I do low level, more actual situations with the dogs. Then we do more intense actual situations with the dogs. And throughout the process, the dog is to remain calm, not to bark, not to growl, uh, not to bite, not to lunge at the person or any of that sort of thing. And, uh, and if you do that process correctly, then your dog just goes, oh yeah, this is no big deal. The, my person's not being attacked and I haven't been told to bite, so I'm gonna be aware, I'm gonna be alert, but I'm not actually going to do anything. And then dealing with interpersonal conflict in general. My advice to my clients whenever they come and they get a dog from us and we're doing their dog delivery is, you win every fight you don't have. And what I mean by that is, and we I've probably mentioned this in other episodes, is, you know, any fight, it doesn't matter how good a fighter you are, how trained you are, any fight, some kind of fluke thing can happen and you lose and the other person wins. And that could be you lose and get knocked out. It could mean you lose and get knocked on the ground and kicked until you're unconscious. It could mean you lose and get shot. It could mean you lose and get kidnapped, okay? There, is, there are no guarantees in fights. End of story, no guarantees. You cannot find somebody. If anybody guarantees you a result in a fight, they're, they are a false trainer. They don't know what they're talking about. They're an idiot, okay? Because there are no guarantees. You can stack the odds in your favor, but that still doesn't mean there's a guarantee. So if you're going to get in a fight, that means there's a potential you will lose. You know what fight you never lose? The one you don't have. So if you can avoid a fight, you should always avoid a fight, okay? Now, again, we've been talking about, you know, just friendly debates and things like that, and I'm not saying that you should always avoid those things, but I am saying that if the situation is going to get heated to the point where you and or your dog would interpret it as an actual threat situation potentially, then you probably need to work on dealing with interpersonal conflict and maybe you don't need to have those conversations with those people, right? Some people have relatives that they really shouldn't interact with that much. And you know, some people get upset when I say that kind of stuff. Um, you can do whatever the heck you want to, it's your life, I don't care. But if you are around people who you get in very heated discussions with, very heated debates and arguments with a lot, and it's not your spouse, which hopefully you don't get in those kind of arguments a lot with your spouse, but if you get in those situations a lot, you probably are thriving off interpersonal conflict, which is not a healthy thing. I'll just leave it at that. Um, if you're finding yourself being pulled into them, like it's your spouse's family and you have to go over for Thanksgiving, but you know that the people that are gonna be there are people that you don't agree with on a lot of topics and you get into heated debates, just have the courage to say, I'm not going. And I mean, it's your choice. You live your life however you want. But in my opinion, you're a fool if you continue to go to those situations frequently. You're setting yourself up for failure. People that are hyper opinionated, like me, are not going to be convinced by your other heated arguments, right? How many times have you ever heard of, seen, or experienced yelling at somebody else to prove your point and they go, oh yeah, you're right. Whenever we elevate our vocals, whenever we elevate the situation, what it almost always does, 99.999 to infinity percent of the time, what it does is it creates an emotional response in the person where even if they would have agreed with us previously, they will resist it and won't agree even if you know they realize we have a better argument because they've been emotionally set off. They've been, you've angered them, you've emotionally triggered something in them. I hate the stupid triggered word, but you know, in this particular uh, situation it applies. And they go, now I'm mad, I don't care what you say, I'm not gonna listen, right? And, and all they wanna do is yell or argue back and they're gonna 
you know, double down on their points and they're not going to listen to anything you say. So it's unproductive. So if that's where you end up finding yourself, if it's me, I don't go. I don't go to a lot of family events. I don't go to a lot of other public events because I'm not interested in being in those situations. If you want to be in those situations, just understand that's the risk that you take if you decide to do that. All right, so I hope these thoughts have been helpful for you today. Uh, if you have a dog, I hope this has helped you work through some of the questions and concerns that you might have in these situations and has given you a plan for what you can do in the future. If you uh, have any other thoughts, additional questions, situations I did not address, uh, you can always email me at joel at fortressk9.com. You can call, or no, you cannot call me. You can text me at 813-836-9244. You can find more information about both our companies by visiting fortressk9.com or k9academyonline.com. And you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube by searching for both our companies. So until next time, I hope this has been helpful. Remember to train hard and stay safe. Canine Podcast.